14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> the Word put on flesh. Now we can, we can talk at length about how John uses the word logos to refer to the Word of God and how the overarching Greek philosophy of the time saw logos as this organizing principle that existed behind all of everything. It's the word we get logic from. And how logos was impersonal, but it, it was in everything. It's the logos that drives you to realize that, you know, a 90, you, know, you drive a nail all the way in so that things don't fall apart. It was logos that makes math work because that's how everything fits together. And how John is using that word and, and how that's going to make sense and it's going to click to the Greek-speaking people and the Greek philosophy of his age. And we could also dwell at length about how the Hebrew people, the Hebrew-speaking Jews, really fully grasp the idea of the word of God because that's how scripture starts. Better sheep that are not Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and He goes on and says, and God spoke. There's a term for the Ten Commandments, it's called the Decalogue, which means the Ten Words. You know, God's Word was a big deal. And so when we translate the Bible from Hebrew into Greek, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, what for the Jews was all of their scripture. They use the word logos to refer to God's words and the words that God speaks and how those were powerful. And so you have the Greek idea of the logos, the word that is the underlying order of everything in the universe and everything holds together. The logos is what makes things go. They didn't fully understand gravity the way we do, but they understood that stuff fell down and they called that part of the logos of the universe. And then you have the Hebrew idea of the, the Word of God, the Logos of God. And the reason stuff falls down is because God says stuff should fall down. Really and truly. He made the universe by His Word to make stuff fall down and not fall up. And so for the Greeks, the Logos was impersonal. For the Jews, the Logos was powerful. And then John has the Logos do something that neither one of them really would have expected, and that is to put on flesh and become personal and dwell among us. And yet for John, it's just the exact next step that God is going to take, that there's no sense in God creating a universe that is you know, completely impersonal, it's got a perfect structure, but it's not personal. There's nothing to, uh, that's in my mind. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing personal. God created a universe in which people exist. They have personality. They have relationships. And so it's the perfect and most logical next step. And that the word is powerful, but the word has to be understood. And so the word puts on flesh. It looks like us. A word comes and he ends up acting, living, breathing, and experiencing the world and dwelt among us. The word dwelt there is the same verb that relates to the idea of the tabernacle where God dwelt with the people. In Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, God dwells among his people through a tent. In John, God dwells among his people through the word made flesh. Once again, you see why we read the Old Testament? Because God comes and lives among his people, not in a tent this time, but in a body. He puts on flesh and dwells among us. Fully God and fully man, God puts on flesh and dwells among us, and we see his glory. In the Exodus, the, the glory of God would come down on the tabernacle, and they would see it, and the glory would depart and go... And they would follow it. But in this case, it's that his glory comes down and it's right there. And we see it. And John is writing. Keep in mind, John does not write the Gospel of John as things are going on. He writes looking back. 
He writes the Gospel of John, I would tell you, 60 years afterwards, maybe 50. I'd say 60. He's probably in his 70s when he writes it, if not in his 80s. This is a mature reflection on the things he saw as a young man in his late teens, early 20s. That's what I would tell you. You can look up in other books and find other opinions. But that's what I would tell you. And so John is not saying this halfway through when he sees the transfiguration and it's all cool and amazing. He's not saying this the next day after he's seen Jesus walk on water and feed the 5,000 and drive out the demons and raise the dead and heal the sick. John is saying this looking back and having seen the cross and seen the empty tomb. When John says we saw his glory, he's talking about all of it. The price of sin and the glory of the resurrection. We saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten Son of the Father. That's one of those special words in Scripture. It's not used to very many people. In fact, in the New Testament, in referring to people in the New Testament, it only refers to Jesus. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we're not as awesome as Jesus was, and as Jesus is. We have trouble sometimes being both graceful and truthful. And by this graceful, I don't mean, you know, pirouetting around. I mean, you know, showing grace to other people. A lot of us have trouble being graceful. I can fall off the floor. <laughs> it's an amazing talent some people don't have. I am living proof that gravity works. <laughs> As are all the bumps and bruises. It's not the graceful we're talking about. We're talking about showing grace, showing mercy, showing people God's love but also showing God's truth. Jesus was able to be full of both things at the same time. And so if we're going to be like Christ, we have to be able to do both. We have to learn to do both. We have to learn His truth and learn to show forth His grace. And that's part of why He came, not just to be an example, but to go to the cross and display His glory, lift it up, come out of the tomb and display His glory resurrected. And to walk among us and show grace to those who need it, demonstrate His truth to those around Him. And so as we go through this life, a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, we have to live among people if we're going to show them God's glory. I long for finding the verse in the Bible that says... <laughs> And it's okay for you to go lock yourself in a cave with a light and all the books you can stand to read and let people slide pizza to you under the door. <laughs> but it's not there. We dwell among people. Because it's the only place that we can if we're going to show God's glory. That's part of what we need to do. Be among people. In the everyday, ordinary realities of life. I love the idea of mission trips. I want us to go. I, we've got some plans to try to put some things together to go. We've got some plans to send some people places if they're willing to go. We'll be you know, doing our best to help provide financial support, whatever else we can for people to go and share the gospel other places. But for all of us, we have this task. And that is to be a light for Jesus when the Walmart checker cannot count back your change, when your McDonald's burger comes and it's got onions and you told them no onions and you don't want any onions and your fries are cold and the drink machine's not spitting stuff out right. <laughs> I want to send you on a mission trip to try to show Jesus to strangers if you can't show Jesus to people in Stuttgart when McDonald's is screwed up. Because let me tell you something. 23 hours a day, McDonald's is going to make mistakes. And if you can't show the, share the gospel those 23 hours, we really don't want to send you out and put you under pressure for that one more. Because that one hour that they don't make mistakes from 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, most of you are asleep. <laughs> We've got to be able to dwell among people and show God's glory and God's truth. And then when we do go, we also want to be there and be real get involved in people's lives, do the things that people need, where they know us. So 
they can see us do our best to live out grace and truth. And that even includes having to show it to ourselves and to one another. Show some grace and some truth in your relationships that you have. Share the gospel through those. Share God's glory through those. And keep that in mind. When you share what God has done in your life, share the glory of God. The amazing things that he has done. The amazing God that he is. It'll be great whoever wins the Super Bowl tonight because somebody will talk about that they're, they just want to give all the glory to God because they either caught a football or stopped somebody from catching a football. Folks, that is so much slighter than the glory of God is capable of that it's, while I appreciate the, the open public testimony, always, you know, hey, if people are going to look to God and, and come to Scripture, then that's, that's a good step. But God's glory is so much greater than all that. God's glory is seen not in the football player who made an amazing catch, but in some of these football players and the way that they actually live and try to live out their life showing Jesus to the people around them. The ones who take their millions and use it for things like, hey, let's go help folks at a children's home. Let's go do this for people with needs. Let's go and start a hospital. Let's go and share the gospel. The glory of God is not revealed in the five-second basketball play or somebody's great and amazing home run when the real sport comes back around. <laughs> the glory of God is shown 365 days a year in the life that people live. we got to dwell among people and show God's glory to them. Why? Because that's what he did for us. And so as we do that, let's keep in mind, grace and truth are beautiful things. They can live together. And in fact, they need to be together. They need to be get together in your life. The truth is, we all have ways to go before we become as perfect as Christ wants us to be. The graceful part is, God gives us another day to do it. And another day, and another day, and another day. So tomorrow, when you get up, Spend some time delving into God's truth, being grateful for His grace, and getting ready to share both of them with everybody that you see, the person in the mirror, the person across the table, and the person across the counter at work, because every last one of us needs it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be here. We ask the Lord to guide us this week. Help us share your love and your truth with everyone we need. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.